Jed Buckwald, thank you so much for being here at Head on Fire. I appreciate you coming. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so for folks who don't know you, um, and you know, you're, you're not on TV, Oprah hasn't interviewed you recently or anything. So maybe folks might not know your, uh, public profile as, as, uh, as much, um, tell folks a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Well, I am uh, a professor of uh, history here at Caltech. I've been here for over 20 years now. I'm a historian of science by training originally long time ago, and most of my work is in research and history of various aspects of uh, scientific work like Newton and others, although in more recent years, I've also written about um, Egyptology, the decipherment of hieroglyphs and so on. It's actually all related, but uh, different topics. And, uh, and that's basically what I do. Then I run book, I run various book series, journals, and so on. The usual thing that professors do. <laughs> uh, sounds like you'd be the guy I'd want to I'd want to corner at a party and just ask a million questions. So <laughs> glad I have you here at my party. Um, so I have you here today. Uh, you are a science historian. I have you here today to talk about some science and the way that it has developed into our modern world, specifically quantum physics. Um, that term has been in pop culture discussion since I can remember. The first time I really heard it uh, was in uh, a documentary called What the Bleak Do We Know, uh, which talked about the supposed law of attraction uh, or the secret in which it seemed that the idea of an observer on reality affecting reality was sort of stretched to mean thoughts or things. Anyways, in the years since the term has been used in film and television to mean a kind of science magic, uh, basically whatever the protagonist wants to do a crazy thing, the science character finds an explanation for why the thing is possible due to quantum physics. We need to look no further than the fast and loose way quantum physics plays a role in things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So my question, and I feel like a lot of people's question when they hear the term is what is quantum physics actually? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, uh, that's close to asking me, what is the <laughs> deep nature of reality in the universe? Um, oh, that's question I'm three. A, no. <laughs> I am, uh, although I'm trained as a physicist, I am a historian of physics. Um, how shall I put this? Uh, like almost any reasonably well-evolved area in the history of any aspect of science, it's a technical structure which is designed and evolved to explain certain fundamental aspects that are testable and observable of the way the world is, things that we can approach. And there's a long history to how quantum mechanics developed and whatnot. And it does sound uh, very spooky uh, to people when they first learned about it, because the world is seen through the um, window, if you will, of quantum mechanics is not a world that really consists of things that we normally deal with on a daily basis. <laughs> um, uh, it does involve particles, but it also involves aspects of particles that uh, are not uh, what one would normally think about. <laughs> uh, you can't uh, shoot a quantum mechanical object directly at a target uh, with a certain speed and be sure that it's going to hit just where you aimed it. That's not the way the world works. Uh, it's much more complex than that. Uh, and so the developers of quantum mechanics in the early parts of the 20th century eventually uh, decided, and it took quite a while to come to a structure of this kind, that underpinning the world and every object in the world is what came to be called a wave function. Now, I don't think of waves like we normally do, although this is a mathematical object which is has certain properties that are similar mathematically to what waves are. Mm -hmm. But it isn't the wave like a water wave. In fact, unlike waves that we normally deal with mathematically, it's made up out of complex numbers. 
partially imaginary numbers, things that uh, are very different, uh, but that mathematically have a well-articulatable structure. And what this thing does is that when you, as it were, multiply it by itself, actually what's called the complex conjugate of itself, anyway, you do something with it. And what it determines is the probability that an object, like an electron, will be found in a certain region or will have a certain speed. It can't have exactly a certain speed and be somewhere. In fact, if it had a very precise speed, it could be almost anywhere. On the other hand, if you know very precisely where it is, you really have no idea whatsoever uh, what its speed may be, actually it's momentum and so on. Anyway, the point is, is that um, although this sounds spooky and strange, from our point of view, it leads to highly testable experimental consequences, which we live with today. You're looking at me and I'm looking at you through an object which is grounded on the laws of quantum mechanics. The very microchips and uh, 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 microstructures that govern the internet are in fact the results of quantum mechanical interactions at this very low uh, microscopical level and so on. Now, although mathematically, you can handle things when you structure an experiment very well. Uh, and you can even do experiments on things that are very strange. Uh, that, uh, uh, But that worked quite well. Um, nevertheless, there is an ongoing issue with, if you will, the conceptual underpinnings of quantum mechanics. And let me try and make it as, and I am no expert on this, but let me try and make it as simple as I can. When I said a few moments ago that if you try to shoot an electron through an opening, mm -hmm. um, you can't shoot it and get it to hit a target you aim at precisely. There's only probabilities of where it'll be. Now, when I said that, I implicitly was separating out the object with the opening in it from the electron itself. And what I'm doing when I do that is I'm not treating the object it's going through as though it too were governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. I'm making an impossible object actually. And this leads to what's called the measurement problem of quantum mechanics that it is, it is in order to um, work through experimental situations and so on, you have to send your objects to interact with things that you don't treat quantum mechanically. And so there is this kind of deep problem, which most physicists, at least until fairly recently, have not been interested in. Um, I will, I can tell you a little story. When I was a uh, uh, taking physics. I was an undergrad and a grad for a, a while at uh, Princeton, way back in the 60s. We took a course in quantum mechanics uh, from a famous professor. There were only about 13 of us in the class at the time. In fact, he'd written the book. His name was Robert Dickey. <clears throat> and I still remember he's at the blackboard and his back is to the class. And on the blackboard, he writes the equation it's called the Schrodinger's equation, which governs quantum mechanics. Uh -huh. Okay, so he writes it down, and everybody's hand went up because <clears throat> uh, everybody wants to know. Well, okay, I've heard about that, but what does it really mean? And I still remember, without turning around, he said, "Gentlemen, it was all men at Princeton in those days." Sure. He said, sure. "Gentlemen, put your hands down. It's given by experiment. We will now calculate the hydrogen atom." In other words, stay away from those icky questions that I just mentioned a moment ago. And so I can't really answer the question you told me, or you just asked me, uh, except to give you a sense. We can calculate. We can even 
do some very spooky things, such as with quantum information theory and so on. But it's all consistent mathematically until you start asking about this deeper question of how these objects treated quantum mechanically interact with measuring apparatus, which you don't treat quantum mechanically. I want to ask a really dumb question. Um, and it's, it's so I, I just want to define a couple of terms here uh, that that come up when discussing quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and different articles that I've read. Um, what is a particle? Because I, I have some questions on my list here that that I, I have made particle a synonym for the word thing. Oh, it's just a thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it is it, is it like it, a proton, like neutron, a proton, electron, electron, electron quark, electron, some somewhere in that realm? Um, also, what is an observer? What counts as an observer? Well, okay, you know, the particle thing is usually um, it's used for any object uh, whose behavior requires the use of quantum mechanics for determining what's going to be going on. Uh, even using probabilities. So these are these are you know micro objects, uh, the size and you know, the size even an atom on the whole would be rather large for most of these things. Electrons, neutrons, uh, at the lowest lower levels, quarks and things of that kind, which make up other particles. And these are all governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. Uh, in, and uh, in particular by what's called the standard theory, <clears throat> which has been developed in the last uh, 60 years or so. Uh, and that works. You know, that works. That works. It works very well uh, for calculating stuff. Now, you ask, what is an observer? An observer is, loosely speaking, the measuring device that I just mentioned a few moments ago. It's any kind of, loosely speaking, it tends to refer to a macroscopic object, an object that you don't treat quantum mechanically, which is interacting with an object that you do treat quantum mechanically. So I think that what a lot of people hear when they hear observer is they center the human experience, right? They think of, well, when we're looking at it, when, yeah. when we as humans are looking at something, it's that when the tree falls in the forest, you know, in question. But it's not that. It's not us, right? No, right? no it's certainly, well, I mean, we can be observers in that sure, sense, sure. but but we are merely macroscopic, that is, large-scale, non-quantumly treatable objects. Uh, so when I hear the word observer, I hear the word observer in tandem with a particle or something exists when we're looking at it and it doesn't when we're not, or something like that. I'm very I'm dumb. Very I majored in criminal me. justice. So... <laughs> Um, but when I when I hear the word observer, it almost sounds as though, or at least in the articles that I've read by uh, on who knows how reputable the websites are, um, that the observer is in some way informing what they're looking at, that that they are uh, creating what they're looking at or causing what they're looking at. Is is any of that true? And if not, how did we get there in thought? <laughs> Well, um, the last thing you says, the observer is causing what they're looking at. Let me take off the looking at business because an observer is a measuring device. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's not, it could be, you know, it could, it could be this pen if it's interacting with a, a particle and so on. Um, uh, and, When a measuring device treated non-quantum mechanically, as I said, <laughs> interacts with a particle or a quantum mechanically treatable object, then, <clears throat> how shall I put this? Um, the quantum mechanical object is reduced to one of what are called the possible states 
that it can exist in. And by states, you can have states of position, states of um, momentum, uh, states of energy, states of time. That is, uh, uh, is it here at a certain time? Is it in an et cetera, et cetera. And this quantum uh, function called the wave function determines the probability given the surrounding structures that the object will be found in one of its states when it interacts with those surrounding structures. So you can't say that it's in any that, you know, it's not like the particle is flying along and mm -hmm. there it is. And we just don't know where it is. No, that's not how it's generally thought about. The particle is itself um, intrinsically bound to this wave function. And until it interacts with a non-quantum object to produce a measurement, like you're shooting electrons through a little slit, there's a screen. And when an electron hits the screen, the spot that it hit glows, okay? Well, you don't know except what the probability is where it's gonna hit. And you can't say it's specifically anywhere until it is reduced to one of its possible existing states, which you can predict only probabilistically. Is that is that the double slit experiment? Is that I, I have that on my list to ask you about because that that also seems like science magic. <laughs> sure, actually, I was referring to a single slit, but it, same principle holds. Actually, uh, although the mathematics is a little different, just as it is in light. Uh, yes, um, because this um, wave function is governed mathematically by equations that are similar to the ones that hold for, say, light, and in the usual classical sense, um, <clears throat> if you, it, it, it's, his, it's like passing a wave through two slits. Uh, if you imagine a water wave, okay? There's a big water wave, the wave goes like this, and here's two, uh, it's, it's in the ocean, and we have two barriers, and it has two holes, and the wave goes through there. Well, each, when the wave hits each part, it sends out little waves from those parts. And those waves, they interfere with one another. And so they've produced big crests and low troughs and so on. Well, the same thing, mathematically at any rate, happens with uh, the wave function. and But the troughs and the crests are the probability points which determine where you are likely when to find the particle when that spot shows up on the screen. I want to ask, uh, turn from trying to define what quantum physics is, as I think we've very well established, it's kind of difficult to define. <laughs> um, there have been a lot of conversations in the last year or so, a lot more articles being published about this next subject, um, time. The, the idea that time isn't real, <laughs> that, that our perception of time is, is just an illusion that our brain is making up to get us through life. Um, I was asking some of my, my listeners if they had any one question for you, what would it be? And several of them put through, do you believe in time? Um, all right. Let me first say, I hate a question which is aiming at a kind of scientific thing, which uses the word believe. <laughs> Belief has nothing Valid. to do with it. Nothing whatsoever. I don't believe in the theory of evolution. I find it a well-grounded scientific structure backed by considerable evidence. Belief has nothing to do with it. Okay. You want to talk about religion, we can talk about belief. Sure. sure. Okay. That's a different issue. Um, time is within the context of both um, quantum mechanics and relativity theory, uh, one of the 
um, parameters that determines how the structure works. Now, since the early 20th century, with the development first of special relativity and then more complexly of general relativity, um, the conventional notion of time uh, in which uh, people would think that, well, if something happens here at a certain time, then uh, somebody three billion miles away still has the same time uh, for when that thing happened. Let's say an explosion happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, no, they don't, uh, because time functions as one of what are called the coordinates mathematically in a four dimensional, not three dimensional space, the space of space time. Uh, and in that, it's perfectly real. There's nothing unreal about it at all. Uh, and it works very well mathematically. It does mean that we had to alter our technical understanding of what it means to say that two events occur at the same time. What does it mean to say they are simultaneous? Those are um, different meanings, depending on how you want to do it. And so in physics, uh, physicists speak of the space-time coordinates of an event. And in, in the mathematics of space-time, if you take two events, one occurs at a certain time, at a certain position, and another occurs at another time, at another position, okay, then we speak of the space-time distance in this four-dimensional realm between these two events. And that space-time difference, distance, excuse me, is the same for different, well, uniformly moving, anyway, different observers, okay? But the, the, the measurable distance, as though if I were to take, for instance, my ruler here, um, somebody would measure a physically different physical distance uh, at a different uh, place in space-time. And would, if they had a clock to measure the time between two things, they have a different time. But this, this, the spatial distance put together with the time difference using a, a simple formula is the same for all observers. So we replace our normal understanding of physical separation with this separation in, in what's called space-time. And there's nothing imaginary about time at all. It's just that it has um, uh, properties that uh, one would not intuitively find obvious. I think, I think when I say time is imaginary, imaginary. Or something like that, I think what, what, what I'm referencing, I'm referencing is, is this idea, idea in sort of pop sort of culture pop right, now right now that, that our future selves, our past selves, our present selves are all coexisting at the same time. We just can't see them because we perceive time as linear thing. And according to quantum physics in, in the articles and the pop culture and stuff, um, it, it isn't linear. And all of those things are happening simultaneously. We just can't see it. But if we had the right perspective, we could. Is that, does that have any relation to what you understand the science to be? No. <laughs> All right. Oh. There you're, you're, you're pushing things to, uh, you know, the, uh, the ultimate speculative end as to how we understand these things and what the ultimate nature of uh, the universe is, whether there are multiverses, multi-universes, and so on. No. In the universe, we exist in. Okay, with all the galaxies that are out there and so on, all the way back to <laughs> the moments uh, after the universe came into being as we know it. Um, time functions, you can't, you can't go, it doesn't mean anything to go backwards in time, really. Um, there are ways of thinking about it in sort of extreme physical um theories, which are mostly non-testable and so on, involving multiple universes and so on, maybe. Uh, and um, uh, if you ever saw the movie Interstellar, for instance, 
Uh, and that was uh, the science advisor was one of our friends here, Kip Thorne. Uh, and then, you know, there, you know, the guy is floating around and he looks at himself from before and so on. Well, there is no physical theory worked out, grounded on experimental structures in full detail that would really fully lead you to something like that, though there are, you know, speculative possibilities. But in the practicing world of physics that my friends operate in and I know about, that's nobody is going back and, um, you know, uh, doing something to themselves when they were babies. So y'all don't have any DeLoreans or Caltech anywhere in a in a <laughs> in a garage somewhere. <laughs> Not that I know about. Not that I know about. Um, can I ask about quantum computing? Uh, and and I know that you referenced technology earlier, quantum computing and, and what impact that will have on the technology available to just regular people like us in the years to come. Well, I mean, this really pushes anything I know very far, although here at Caltech, um, John Preskill and others are some of the uh, major investigators in quantum computing. So to the extent I understand it, which is not very deeply because it's a technical endeavor, uh, it, it, it depends on what's known as coherence. Um, how shall I try and put this? It could sound very spooky. Uh, <laughs> um, let's say at a certain, in, within a certain region, uh, two particles uh, have, um, are interacting with one another. And in quantum mechanical sense, they cohere. That is, certain properties that each has are linked together. Although you don't know, except probabilistically, what those properties, values may be. Now, one particle goes off over there, and another particle comes here. And when I measure a certain property of particle A over here, the coherent, because of coherence, particle B will necessarily have a certain property related, certain value of property related. Now that sounds spooky because does it mean this guy's sending a signal to that guy? No, it's not sending a signal to him. They're connected coherently. You can't use that to send messages faster than light. You could do this. You could say to your friend sitting next to you here, okay, we're creating these two particles. Uh, <clears throat> And you talk to, let's say he's sitting somewhere else, you talk to him over the phone and you say, I'm creating these, these, these two particles and um, uh, in the future, in a day, I'll create these particles uh, and um, I'm going to measure the particle I keep and then I will know what measurement you're going to get over there. And if you get measurement A, I want you to do something, but if you get measurement B, I want you to do something, and I will then know what he's going to do without having spoken to him since then. But I don't have to send him a message. I set it up ahead of time. But I don't know which of the two things he's going to do until I make the measurement. Quantum computing is connected to this question of coherence. Don't ask me much more than that. <laughs> so I I want to ask a question that um, I, I I feel like a lot of I feel like a lot of people who who are like me team, that are inquisitive team. people that like knowledge that like knowledge for knowledge's sake and and want to learn That's things and are sort of fascinated by you know current science news and stuff have it have alerts for it on my Twitter feed Twitter and all of that. All that. I feel like I at least understand how I interact on a daily basis with the fields of biology or chemistry and even just straight up regular physics. I feel like I have a good understanding of how they impact my daily life, how they are used by experts in different fields to impact my life. Um, but what about quantum physics? How does the average person interact with that science right now and how might we in the future? 
Well, I mean, as I said, um, anything that you use electronically nowadays is basically grounded on quantum mechanical structures. Mm -hmm. That's how they work at the the chips, the, the, the structures on the chips down at the nanotechnology level. The, uh, these things are based on quantum mechanical properties. Uh, so um, every object that you use that way these days, since microchips are in everything, including your cars, uh, uh, when you're talking to Siri, you're talking to something which uh, is grounded on a machine, if you will, that is quantum mechanical in nature. So we're interacting with quantum mechanical objects in the modern world in every possible way, maybe even more so than people in the um, 19th century who interacted with trains by traveled on trains, because not everybody traveled on a train every day, but everybody I know is looking at their cell phones all day long, and those are quantum mechanically based. Did the Big Bang Theory, the TV show, The Big Bang Theory, uh, help or hurt the public's base knowledge, knowledge. of quantum, quantum physics? physics. Uh, I feel like there's a whole lot of people whose touch point for the uh, uh, for quantum, quantum physics, physics are things like Big Bang Theory, Marvel Cinematic Universe, the new Ant-Man movie is Quantum Mania. Uh, Doctor Strange even just talked about multiverses and quantum mechanics and stuff. Uh, how, how are these references helping or hurting the field of, of quantum physics a, 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 as far as it relates to its interaction with the public at large? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all. These movies, silly though a lot of them are, <laughs> are nevertheless quite amusing uh, and uh the idea that you know the, the the world that physicists and engineering physicists deal with and work with and so on um, is connected to these things is uh, I, I don't see any particular problem with that quite quite the contrary why not keep if it excites anybody as long as some 15 year old doesn't think that uh, he or she is going to grow up and make a time machine or something like that but but that they might want to be an engineer or a physicist or a chemist, uh, that that's fantastic if it if it uh, does. And I know that a lot of the Caltech students around here, they you know they watch this stuff. They've played video games and so on. Even I play video games, and and and, and uh, there you're living in a very interesting space, uh, which uh, can lead people to be more interested in making careers in science, technology, engineering, and medicine. And we can use more people doing that, not fewer. No press is bad press, right? <laughs> right. Uh, what excites you about the field right now? Yeah, what well, What are you looking at? What Who? What? What? What's the next uh, horizon that you're looking at? Who are the people you're watching? What are the next developments? Well, that's hard to say. I'm not a physicist. I am a historian, which means I deal with things sometimes hundreds of years old, not what's happening right now. Um, it seems to me from what I see around that the most interesting work is being, a lot of the most interesting work is being done uh, with the um, properties of complicated uh, structures down at the very micro level, how to, uh, how to work and analyze uh, such things. And the other area that is always extremely interesting is uh, investigations of, uh, in astrophysics and, uh, and astronomy, uh, probing the <coughs> properties of the early universe uh, and so on. That's uh, a big topic at Caltech, has been for a long time. Uh, and it remains extraordinarily interesting with lots more to discover. Uh, I mean, we, we don't really know. We, we can't get past the um, minuscule moment in time after which what's called the cosmic microwave background, which we can measure, came into being. In other words, we don't really know what happened. There's all kinds of th theories. Uh, and so on. Um, but a lot of 
uh, structures are fairly well attested, including something called inflation, which is like a giant expansion of the of the uh, metrical framework of space time. <clears throat> uh, uh, after things came into being, but what happened at creation? It's who knows so far. There may be traces. Even some of this multiverse stuff, there are physicists I've read about who claim that if there are multiverses, they may have left traces in the cosmic microwave background, which might be measurable and detectable. There, it's beyond anything I could speak even remotely reasonably about. Uh, I, I I do like that your, your fields are uh, science and Egyptology. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like those are the two realms where the most conspiracy theories abound <laughs> or or something like a conspiracy theory. Do you have a favorite Egypt uh, conspiracy theory? Well, um, a conspiracy theory. Oh, you know, just all those strange rumors that end up on the History Channel at 1 a.m. where, you know, I don't know, the pyramids are trying to tell us something from some kind of aliens or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. They're, what, the pyramids are telling us many interesting things about Egyptians, uh, you know, uh, f more than 4,000 years ago and so on. And there's still an awful lot to be learned about that. Um, I, I, the, the, the reason I got into the uh, subject at all was because of history of science was many years ago, um, my wife and I were in Paris at some meeting or other, and um, we went to a bookstore. In those days, there were still bookstores, you know, those physical objects which have, you know, pieces of paper in them. I've written three of them. I, I know, <laughs> I know. Yes. yes. Good. And uh, I always ask my students that, you know, at this point. But uh, anyway, we went in and wandering around, I was looking for old, 19th century uh, mathematics and physics text, but I saw something uh, in the corner which uh, had uh, in gold stamped on the cover the French word zodiac, meaning zodiac. I opened it up and there were pamphlets from the early 1800s about this um, Egyptian zodiac ceiling, which had sort of a description of the, uh, of the zodiac on it. Uh, and that had been brought to Paris uh, after Napoleon and so on, and it generated a controversy because some scientists, astronomers, were claiming that you could date it to 13,000 BC, and this was after the restoration of the French monarchy, which then, which was deeply religious, which brought it into conflict with um, religious convictions on the age of the earth and so on. So uh, with one of my former PhD students, uh, who was a novelist, uh, Diane Greco Josephowitz, uh, we wrote a book on that. And then we decided to pursue it further because one of the characters was involved to how the hieroglyphs uh, were finally read. I don't like using the word decipherment too much, though it's meaningful because when you say decipherment, people tend to think about something that's hiding something hmm. and you're going to decode it. Uh, it has multiple meanings, but so we wrote a book on that. So that's how we got into that. So it originated in a kind of science topic, but then evolved. Uh, although one of the two protagonists, Thomas Young, was one of the great scientists of the early 19th century, early 1800s. So I knew about him. I'd written some stuff about his science before. So that's how we got into it. And my wife and I traveled twice to Egypt, where I was able to photograph where that ceiling was cut out. And it exists now in the Louvre in Paris. And it is one of the two earliest evidences, examples of what I would call archeological depredations, cut out and brought to Paris, uh, leaving a giant hole in the temple uh, where it had been, Temple of Dendera. Even Champollion, one of the decipherers of hieroglyphs, the early 1800s hated that that had happened as a sort of archaeological vandalism. 
And the Egyptians would dearly like to have it back today, but I don't think the French are going to give it back. I think there's a few museums out there uh, where I, I think a lot of people want to just empty them out. <laughs> yeah. Give everything back to, to where it came from. Um, for folks who might be interested and aren't quite sure that they want to dive all the way in, how can folks get started learning more about physics, quantum physics, engineering? Uh, what's a good starting point for them? Well, there are so many uh, relatively well-written popular books uh, on various aspects of these things that, that I cannot hesitate to really uh, recommend anything in particular. Um, but if they were just to go on Google and uh, start looking around or Amazon books, they'll find plenty of things which can sort of bring them into it without delving them too much into the depths of, you know, complicated physics. Although that's interesting. <laughs> it is. It is very interesting. Yeah, I've, I've, I've learned I've, a lot. I feel like I'm going to have to go back and listen to this interview, this interview five or, five six, or six, six times to figure out what it is that I learned, that I learned. but I'm gonna, I feel like I learned a lot. Uh, Jed Buckwald, thank you so much for uh, for being here um, and, and sharing so much of your knowledge uh, about a topic that um, – it isn't very well known to a lot of people. <laughs> we don't, we, we, like you said, we interact with it uh, on a daily basis, but we might not understand yeah. what it is that we're interacting, interacting with, with uh, at least uh, the layman. Least um, um, for folks who uh, might be interested in you, your research, your work, uh, where could folks learn a little bit more about you? Uh, I have a website. Uh, I think it's, uh, what is it? I never use my own website so it's hard to say that, that's, 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 that's that is the answer that everyone that i know who has ever had a website <laughs> including website. myself has to say wait what's my website right. what's my own email uh, yes. address <laughs> it's uh jzbuckwald.caltech.edu and well, it has well, thank you. it's not very elaborate it has uh, various things on it including a list of stuff i've written well, I'm sure I'm folks sure are going to be really here. excited to go uh, to go read know, that. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you being here. You have a good rest of your day, sir. Bye-bye.